Hello, clean water act enthusiasts. Adam Ward here. I want to talk with you today about how the jurisdictional scope of the clean water act, meaning what is actually protected has changed in the Wabash river basin over the last 70 or so years. Um, this talk and the associated manuscripts, um, are co-authored along with Riley Walsh, um, who earned two master's degrees from the O'Neill school of public and environmental affairs at Indiana university. So when we talk about the clean water act jurisdiction, what do we actually mean? In other words, what defines the waters that deserve protection or are afforded protection under the Federal Clean Water Act? Uh, first and foremost are federal laws. And so what you can see here are laws that are passed by the House and Senate. So these are coming out of Congress, um, starting in the 1948 Federal Water Pollution Control Act, of course, the Clean Water Act amendments, most famously of 1972, and a couple other adjustments along the way. Uh, now, in addition to these federal laws, which enable something to be done, um, there are agencies which are part of the executive branch. Um, the US EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers are tasked with enforcement of the Clean Water Act. And so what you see in the blue squares now on the right hand side are publications in the Federal Register. So these are essentially the rules uh, that these agencies have come up with along the way. And so you can see in the late 80s, we really transitioned from a lawmaking period into a agency managed period in the Clean Water Act. Of course, the judicial branch is involved here too. Um, major Supreme Court decisions um, starting in the mid 70s with Callaway uh, and continuing all the way on to, I guess, two years ago now, the County of Maui decision and continuing legislation uh, that is being debated in the Supreme Court. Uh, and not only are all three branches of government involved in this formal way, um, but there are a host of other documents that are used when we try to interpret jurisdiction, um, things like fact sheets, guidance that are issued um, along the way. And so these also inform the way that a rule is to be enforced. So what you're seeing on the right is essentially a timeline of major laws, court cases, publications, and other sources or events uh, that we reviewed to try to figure out which waters were protected and when over the last 70 or so years. And for myself and Riley, we split this into four eras. Um, at the bottom in purple is what we call Pre-Clean Water Act. Um, so this is the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Uh, this is well-meaning, well-intentioned, um, but honestly, there was never any enforcement. Um, so while protecting clean water at the federal level um, has been in existence since at least 1948, um, really this period saw good ideas with, with no teeth. Um, from the early 70s to the early 80s, um, this is in the wake of the Clean Water Act amendments, um, we describe this era as learning agency teamwork. This is the period where the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers are trying to figure out what do we do with our newfound powers? How shall we enforce this? How does this relate to our missions? And that takes us up to about 1982. Um, that is the point where the US and Riverside Bayview really starts to kick off some of our debates. Um, and for the next uh, you know, 20 or so years, um, much of the debate, both in the lawmaking, in the agent, of the executive branch um, and in the court decisions were about wetlands. So we went from large rivers and lakes, which were understood to be protected up into the landscape out of the active channel and started to understand which wetlands were going to be regulated. Um, the most recent era we perceive as kicking off in 2006. Um, this is when the Rapanos Supreme Court decision was made. Uh, this triggered a host of new rulemaking activities, um, which themselves triggered a host of new lawsuits, uh, and really a, a cycle of court decisions, rulemaking, uh, and politics saying, let's change that and let's fix that. Um, the modern debate um, is not really about if wetlands can be preserved or protected. It's not really about if headwaters can be protected. It's really about which of those waters would be protected and what are the definitions that we use to decide something is or is not uh, receiving protections under the federal clean water act as i mentioned there has been a pretty stark change um, from the let's say the first 40 years to the most recent 40 years 
of Clean Water Act policy at the federal level. Um, early years were characterized by the legislative branch leading, um, including overriding Nixon's veto of the Clean Water Act uh, by a healthy margin. Uh, so Congress was making laws and the executive branch was enforcing those laws. And the Supreme Court was involved a few times to make some decisions along the way or interpretations, but this was primarily between the legislative and executive branches. Um, I'll contrast that with what we've seen really since the turn of the millennium, uh, which is more of a battle that's being waged um, between the courts and the executive branch or the agencies. Um, so we get decisions from the Supreme Court that sends the agencies back to the drawing board. Um, sometimes the rulemaking uh, triggers lawsuits other times, um, at least twice in recent past. Um, the changing of the head of our executive branch and new president has come in with the issuance of executive orders to revisit the rulemaking process or revisit definitions. Um, and so it's notable to me that since 2000 and truly since 1987, Congress has basically stepped back, it said the laws are written as they are. We aren't going to touch it anymore agencies and courts, you all figure this out. Uh, and so the result of that is a much more litigious place um, where lawsuits and rulemaking are setting policy instead of, the, um, instead of the Congress setting the policies and leaving it to the agencies to simply in enforce them. So this is a historical overview. What does it mean on the ground? In other words, we see what's happened since 1948 in a very abstract way. What could we infer has happened to our streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands? And so to answer that question, uh, we first had to find out what was actually being enforced. And so as we look through time on the x-axis, uh, what you can see numbered 1 through 11 here are the various rules that were the primary basis for enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Um, You'll note that there are two spots where I've indicated with some colored boxes. Um, in both locations that are red, and this is essentially through the 70s, uh, we had the Army Corps and EPA enforcing different rules. So two agencies, each with their own views, um, which were not necessarily uh, consistent with one another. And so that really is the learning agency teamwork period. Uh, and that really ends when we get into the, when we get into the, the mid 80s and the Army Corps and EPA are starting to collaborate then. You'll also see there's a small sliver there um, in blue that says different states. Um, this is because of a lawsuit uh, at the federal level that put a stay on the enforcement of the navigable waters protection rule. Um, in short, it left some places enforcing a new law and other places, or excuse me, a new rule. Um, other places reverting back to a previous rule um, while a court case was being decided. So depending on what state you were in, you may have had different enforcement. So now that we understand which rules are being enforced, the objective was to translate those from legalese, let's call it, which is not what hydrologists are necessarily fluent in, um, to practical meaning on the landscape. So in order to do this, we defined four types of waters, those that were protected, meaning they are explicitly jurisdictional. There is no question that the laws as written are intended to apply to these waters. Uh, possibly protected waters. These are waters for which no clear definition has been provided, but this would encompass the most generous interpretation of laws, guidance, and decisions. Uh, so for example, if enforcement required determination of an ordinary high water mark, uh, we would decide that the, that waterway is possibly protected. It wasn't black and white, but it's very likely it would be protected under a particular set of rules. Waters could be conditionally protected, meaning they are jurisdictional if a subsequent test were met. Um, under the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, this would have been a public health risk crossing state lines, um, which was never used to enforce anything. Um, in a more modern context, this might be something like the significant nexus test uh, that has been applied in a post-Rapanos world. So these are waters that may be protected if a subsequent test were met. Uh, and finally, there are some waters that are explicitly not jurisdictional. So some rules uh, include provisions um, that rule out waters. Um, a good example of this may be isolated wetlands that are more than 5,000 feet uh, from a surface water body um, 
being considered non-jurisdictional. So we'll use this color scheme on the next couple of slides to look through time at exactly which rules and which waters uh, may have been protected or were definitively protected under the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, so you can see this uh, laid out for streams on this slide. Across the top, we can see which rules were being enforced. Uh, and then in the bottom panel, these are the definitions that we've pulled from the various rules, court cases, guidance documents. Um, so for example, if we look at Section 10 waters, uh, these may have been protected um, up through the 1970s, um, but the Federal Clean Water Act made it explicit that these Section 10 waters were definitively jurisdictional. And so in 1972, you can see that, that um, horizontal bar turn from green to the dark blue color. Um, other definitions were based on meeting the Commerce Clause, having a discharge of a particular uh, amount greater than five cubic feet per second, a threshold that we've used. Um, were the waters interstate and were they definitively within an ordinary high water mark at a low or high end of the estimate? So what we've done is sort of translate the rulemaking into the quantitative descriptors of water bodies. Typically, this means things like flow rates, drainage areas, or proximity to other water bodies. Finally, where will we do this? Um, the analysis I'll show you on the subsequent slides uh, was conducted for the Wabash River Basin. Uh, we picked this because uh, we were in Bloomington, Indiana doing the analysis, so this was our home. Um, this is also a hot spot of nitrogen pollution ultimately reaching the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so the enforcement of the Clean Water Act and what that means for protecting waters is really important in this river basin. Um, I'll also note here, the methods that we employed in this study follow exactly a previous paper um, from myself and Riley um, that's shown on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, essentially what we're using is spatial data analysis um, with things like drainage areas and flow rates, um, proximity measurements, to estimate which waters would have been classified into which types of protection over the years. Now, when we do this for the Wabash River Basin, uh, we've added a third panel along the bottom of the screen. Uh, and what you're seeing there on the y-axis is thousands of miles of streams and what their status was. So we have uh, just over 400,000 miles of surface water, flowing surface waters in the basin. Um, and so you can see over the years um, how we translate from some of those being possibly protected, conditionally protected, or simply not protected at all. Um, an interesting way to think about this plot is to think of reading a column. Um, so in 1960, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was being enforced. No waterways were definitively protected. Um, you can see that there's a small bar of green, about 50,000 miles that we deemed as, um, that we deemed as conditionally protected. Uh, those would be jurisdictional if they met the test of, in that case, a pollutant causing a public health problem crossing a state boundary. Uh, and the remainder of the streams were simply not protected in our analysis. As we move on to 1980, um, for example, now we are in a post Clean Water Act world. Um, about 6,000 miles by our estimates were definitively protected. Um, that's primarily based on their size and their relevance to the Commerce Clause. Uh, and essentially all of the other stream miles could have been protected depending upon the thresholds that someone would choose to implement. Uh, as we move forward, for example, in the year 2000, uh, you can see that with new guidance having been issued by the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA, um, we're now in a, in a world where about 50,000 uh, miles of streams would have been protected and the remainder possibly protected. And so as these column, as the that stack of bars is changing, you're seeing the the relative stream miles that are being protected. And um, we did the same analysis for lakes and also for wetlands. Um, the details of that are in a forthcoming paper linked in the bottom corner of the slide. Uh, I'll show you a few of those results on the coming on the coming slide. So streams at the top. That's what we just looked at, and then you can see the comparable. Um, acres of lakes and acres of wetlands uh, within the Wabash River Basin that would have had various protections. 
So one thing to note here is the Clean Water Act of 1972 is functionally the time when protections actually became possible for surface water bodies. Um, that's very clear for lakes and streams where we see essentially possible protections extended across the board. Um, less clear for wetlands um, based on some subsequent uh, rulemaking processes that came out. So yes, it protected streams and lakes. Uh, it was not really providing robust protections for wetlands in 1972. The series of Supreme Court cases, um, particularly Callaway and Riverside Bayview, clarified that wetlands could be protected. Um, they also expanded the scope to definitively protect um, more stream miles and additional lakes and ponds. Uh, and so you see that sort of stair step in the dark blue pattern. Those are those are essentially court cases and the subsequent rulemaking processes increasing what is definitively protected. And so by the time we get to 1990, for example, um, about two thirds of all wetlands in the Wabash River Basin are federally protected. Uh, and that has remained true um, since that time. Uh, finally, a quick note, when we think about modern Clean Water Act, um, the Rapanos decision, uh, the multiple rules that have been um, drafted and published in the Federal Register with modern changes of presidencies, uh, I want to note these were not massive changes. Uh, in other words, we saw significantly larger changes when we passed the Clean Water Act and some of the rulemaking in the 80s and early 90s uh, than we're seeing in the debates that are happening today. Now, this is not to say there aren't implications for those rules. There absolutely are. Um, I'm saying on a relative basis, they have, a, they have a smaller potential impact than some of the historical changes. So when we say a court decision is rewriting the Clean Water Act or dramatically expanding the scope, um, we should put that in context of where we've come from in the last 70 years. So what should you take home from this? Um, for me, one big point is that jurisdictional uncertainty has not been eliminated. We've been at it for more than 70 years, writing laws, writing rules, arguing in our court system, uh, and there is still significant uncertainty about which waters are protected and, and on what basis. Um, as I said on the previous slide, understanding where we've come from provides context for statements that we make about modern rulemaking. Uh, and perhaps most importantly to me, um, I believe that the geospatial analyses like we've presented here can be useful to inform rulemaking and communicate to the public the implications of these changes. Now, in no way, shape, or form does that replace the need for boots on the ground, inspections, and decision making on case-by-case -case bases, um, but I fundamentally believe that these sorts of analyses are informative for policymakers and for landowners uh, in understanding what the what changes to their waterways may occur when we make changes at the federal level. Um, I'll note that that's in contrast to at least some federal agencies which have suggested that we don't have sufficient data to make estimates about changes in protection. Um, finally, um, a brief plug in the bottom corner of this slide. Uh, this work has been accepted for publication at Wires Water. Uh, it is forthcoming. At the moment, you can see that I've made a bit.ly link to the preprint, so bit.ly slash cwa at 50, uh, and you can grab the preprint of this article uh, and check out the methods for it. Thanks everyone, and I hope this was informative.